pleasure to Okay, hopefully he talked to you about that. Um, he did. I signed off on full distribution of everything. So. Okay, great. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce and to host uh, Dr. Kevin James, um, Professor of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Virginia. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dr. James a few years ago, and um, but I had been reading his work for many years before that. Um, obviously has an impressive training and publication record, but um, to keep this brief, I just wanna highlight what I'm most impressed by personally is that uh, throughout my um, training, I've had lots of people in different fields um, kind of bring to my attention various papers um, by the Janes Group. And I think what's most notable is that they're very diverse in um, the, the novelty um, and the impact. And so for example, I've had people raise work related to um, an experimental assay for detecting um, phosphocyte specific phosphatase activity. I've had people uh, bring up uh, computational methods uh, for deconvolving um, single cell heterogeneity from bulk samples. And then um, most recently, someone brought to my attention um, a computational method for connecting signaling and transcription um, with various types of data sets. And so really just to point out that um, they're really driven by fundamental problems and um, not really tied to particular approaches and, and have really um, made some great advances both in the um, experimental side and computational side and really the integration of the two to really um, get at um, really interesting uh, problems. And so uh, with that, I will um, turn, turn it over to Dr. James. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel, for the invitation and the kind introduction. All those things that you mentioned in the beginning, I'm not gonna talk about any of those, I'll talk about something different uh, today. It's a um, real pleasure to participate in this vi virtual visit to the CMU PIT program and computational systems biology. You have a really terrific group here. I never saw the faculty list all in one page like I did when I picked up my, my speakers. It's really uh, impressive. Looking forward to meeting with several of you later on this, this afternoon. Um, for, for now, I wanted to take to, uh, this hour, 50 minutes, as an opportunity uh, to dive into mathematical modeling more deeply than I ordinarily would, recognizing my audience. Uh, and I'll make a point to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. This soliloquy should really only be about 50 minutes or, or so. Um, the talk deals with viruses uh, and was designed to be three parts scientific, one part educational, uh, and one part hopefully inspirational for anyone who's feeling worn down by this uh, COVID era. Uh, I'm gonna focus on one project, which exemplifies how my lab uh, has handled the challenges that we've all faced uh, and actually made our best effort to turn them into new opportunities. Overall, my group is interested in gaining a systems level understanding of how mammalian cells respond to disease relevant perturbations. The reason why is because we believe it's fertile ground for what I might call a systems bioengineering approach, wherein uh, we iterate through these cycles of four M's here, experimental manipulations and measurements paired with computational modeling and analytical data mining. One disease relevant perturbation of interest to my lab is cancer, the genetic alterations and regulatory adaptations that enable a normal cell to become malignant. And to start off, I wanted to highlight one recent publication from my group and as an example of what I would now call a type of standard for the field of cancer systems biology. In this work, we were interested in understanding the single cell coordination of two transcription factors in breast cancer. We measured the co-expression of these transcription factors in thousands of single cells and contextualized these data with a computational model which was not constructed de novo, but instead wired together from two existing models that we repurposed from the literature shown here in green and magenta. We used this fused model to simulate our experiments and then compare them to measured observations to make predictions about the effect of targeted manipulations. And then using this model, we mined the cancer genome atlas to extract molecular profiles of the subtype of breast cancer we were studying and perform patient specific simulations for transcription factor coordination, which we, uh, for this project just shown here is mutual information or MI, uh, along with the associated sensitivity 
two manipulations, which for this project was reactive oxygen species or ROS. This model guided analysis identified a handful of tumors predicted to be highly susceptible to activators or inhibitors of these pathways. Those are the purple indicated tick marks on the right at the bottom. Um, and this was relevant because one of these transcription factors, NERF2, is a potent inducer, um, uh, potently induced by co commercially available nutraceuticals that you'd find in the grocery store. And so people are doing these type of perturbations to their body um, uh, as we speak. Now, uh, all of this, we're proud of this publication, but I'm summarizing it here to introduce that none of these individual approaches, if you break it down, be, could, would be considered particularly revolutionary uh, because this type of perspective in cancer systems biology is so far along. Let's contrast that with the focus of my talk today, viruses. Now, to me, the perturbations of a virus fall into the same category of problems as what I just described. Uh, but at least to this outsider, the field of virology operates very differently than cancer biology. On the one hand, uh, there's this cottage industry feel to a lot of research programs where one navigates through the viral, uh, the viral taxonomy and virology to dedicate their career to, for example, parvovirus B19. Elsewhere, one can see a strong reactive component where groups move from one public health emergency to the next, where there's avian flu, or Zika virus, or now SARS-CoV-2. What they don't see are a lot of sustained campaigns directed at a class of viruses where the goal is to identify general themes that could be built upon and expanded, like what uh, one often sees in cancer systems biology. If we're going to make, uh, if we're going to adopt such an approach, taking inspiration from cancer systems biology and applying it to virology, uh, what I'd like to do is make a case for enteroviruses as a general test bed and for Coxsackie virus B3 or CDB3 specifically as a leading test case. So Coxsackie virus B3 uh, is a virus in the enterovirus clade. Uh, it's encoded like other enteroviruses as a single-stranded RNA genome yielding one translated polypeptide. Uh, and this is a case, I think it was Einstein that said everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And enteroviruses are really as simple as they come in the viral world. Uh, and this one RNA genome to one translated polypeptide is uh, quite nice because what that means is if for each translation event, we're going to get one and exactly one copy of each of the mature proteins showed here. And this is an important stoichiometric constraint when we start talking about modeling viral life cycle. Moreover, we know what all of these mature proteins do for the life cycle, meaning that we can organize them and abstract them in an authentic way. Third, enteroviruses have decades of quantitative enzymology, genetics, and biophysics available, scattered all over the literature, but it's there to mine. Uh, for example, I'll highlight this remarkable paper uh, from what now, 60 years ago almost, uh, that uh, titled the absolute number of infectious enterovirus particles released from single cells, so a single cell assay six decades uh, ago. And last, enteroviruses cause human disease. And while the, the exemplar polio virus has been called a research field with a rich past, but no future, because it's virtually eradicated, uh, the other strains listed here are still active and infect people across the globe. The biggest void we saw in enterovirus research was the scarcity of cell scale models. There are a few instances of models of evolutionary dynamics, but nothing related to the viral life cycle itself. Uh, and because the genetic architecture of enterovirus is, our, is so simple, and because there's 70 years of knowledge to build upon, and because these viruses are known to act quickly, we sought to uh, attempt something rather audacious, build a kinetic model that was complete from two standpoints. Uh, standpoint one, in capturing the entire temporal arc of infection from start docking on the host cell membrane to cell lysis, full-blown infection. And then completeness in the sense of two, the stoichiometry of the individual components needed for the infection to take place. So let me walk you through uh, the model design and the life cycle as it's understood. So step one here, the virus docks on membrane receptors 
is internalized and the positive strand RNA genome is delivered to the cytoplasm. The delivered positive strand RNA is used as a template for translation using ribosomes from the host cell. And that single polyprotein is autocatalytically cleaved into mature protein subunits with direct roles in the life cycle. And RNA dependent RNA polymerase, all the way down on the bottom here, uh, synthesizes negative strand complementary to the positive strand and then uses this negative strand as template to make many copies of the positive strand for more translation uh, and eventual virion formation. In parallel, these enteroviral proteases, 2A and 3C, uh, are required for the polyprotein cleavage or maturation. And they also help to steal more ribosomes from the host cell for, um, uh, for ad additional translation. And they also cleave additional host cell targets um, to promote infection. And then uh, finally here, we have these structural caps of proteins that instantaneously get together to form one fifth of a self-assembled pentamer and 12 of those join around a viral RNA to form the mature encapsidated virion. And at the center of it all are a set of host cell feedbacks that give rise to an interesting systems level problem. Viral replication requires double strand RNA intermediates that are sensed by the cell and trigger the induction of hundreds of so-called interferon stimulated genes or ISGs. And these collectively shut down the life cycle at the points indicated in my cartoon here. And this pathway for ISGs is itself damaged by the viral proteinases that are uh, matured. And what this creates is a connect kinetic competition between the microbe and its host. And this was the motivation for us thinking we could have some value to building one of these types of uh, dynamical systems models. Overall, we designed the architecture of the model to be modular recognizing that while delivery, this step here, is very specific to each enterovirus, the intracellular core, all of those later steps, is shared by all enteroviruses. And at the end, I'll talk about uh, repurposing the CBB3 model for other enteroviruses, akin to what I showed for the cancer model at the beginning. Now, where were we before the quarantine? Honestly, this project was a bit stagnant. Uh, we could write thesis chapters, we could give platform talks at meetings, but the model was really working. Uh, we achieved simulations that looked like synthetic infections. For instance, the rapid growth of positive strand RNA during this virtual infection. But if we compared to the, uh, the model to the data obtained, we weren't even on the same units, much less on the same scale. One goes left, one goes right. And some species, bore no resemblance to one another, shown here for the negative strand uh, RNA. And because this project was getting quite old at the time and we were operating in the lab with a skeleton crew of one graduate student and me working on the project, uh, what that meant was at any time the two of us were, were doing something, it was usually towards that next experiment that was going to solve all of our problems. And usually that experiment just led to the next set of questions and set us back to the lab when we were running ourselves in circles. And so when SARS-CoV-2 hit, uh, it really changed everything. The, the quarantine altered the problem statement from what's the next piece of data we need to how do we make the most of what we have and turn this effort into a finished project that with a submittable manuscript that we're confident in. Um, and so what we entered is into this era that I'm gonna call uh, MacGyver science. And so for probably a lot of people on the call too, uh, young to get this illusion, but I'll explain to you, MacGyver was a TV show in the late 80s, where every episode consisted of the main character, this guy MacGyver on the, on the right here, getting into some predicament that he needed to get out of by assembling a contraption from the random things that he uh, sees lying around him. It was Rachel Saw, I'm an engineer, so I loved that show. Uh, and this is, in essence, what we did for our research activity during the quarantine. I sent frantic random emails to alumni about pieces of paper stuck to steno pads from four years ago, drove into the lab, got those steno pads and found that piece of paper, blocked off entire theory days in my house to figure out how to fuse observations from two to three pairs of hands uh, in a principled way. My student reorganized every experiment that he had ever done on this project so that we could look at it with fresh eyes. And a project, 
that was perpetually six months away from being ready got pre-printed in late July and favorably reviewed about a month or so ago. And so if you're a year three, four student, feels like their project is stuck, maybe you're a year three, four faculty member who's anxious about their clock, uh, I wanna encourage you to set aside for some of this MacGyver science because it's um, quite remarkable what you can unearth when you make, the, make a priority to sit down and really think about it. I want to give you a, uh, some of the highlights of the, this model refinement and then transition to the central message of the work. First, uh, one of the things that we found was really important is bookkeeping. A complication of quantitative virology is that not every virion released by a cell is infectious uh, as defined by the ability uh, of that particle to kill a field of susceptible host cell. This is a so-called plaque forming unit. The ratio of viral particles to infectious PFUs is large and more bedevilingly is highly variable even when talking about the same strain of virus. Specifically, poliovirus is about as close as can be to CVB3, but with such an enormous range of ratios, 30 to 1,000, it was impossible to put our experiments on the same scale as the model if we didn't know what this ratio was in our own hand. So thanks to those steno pads and a few theory days, we got this ratio from our own viral preps and we were able to reconcile now our data quite nicely with experiments on the same absolute scale. And to orient you for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna show uh, model results as the median plus or minus 90% intervals from 100 or sometimes 500 simulations using parameters in this model that are randomly sampled with a log coefficient variation of about 5%. All the way through the model, we just randomly wiggle these things to show the overall stability of the prediction. And those parameters are based on best estimates from the literature or from the biology. I think we cover 90 plus percent of them based on experimental data. And with a working model in hand, we could tackle pretty fundamental questions in virology rather easily. One facet of the life cycle uh, that I glossed over in my cartoon is the importance of viral replication occurring on intracellular membrane. Let's see if this movie works. Okay. Um, multiple proteins in the interviral genome are uh, dedicated to hijacking cell membranes to form what are called viral replication organelles or VROs. You can see in this uh, EM reconstruction in green. Uh, VROs become detectable by electron microscopy at intermediate times during infection, and they grow to be a dominant fraction of the cell at the time of lysis. So they, at the end, they look like Swiss cheese here, all those empty uh, holes there, those are these engorged viral replication organelles. And virologists have many uh, conceptual arguments for why all RNA viruses, oh, I'm talking about enteroviruses, but all RNA viruses create VROs. And all of them are somewhat hand wavy in the sense that they protect RNA from degradation, they protect RNA from the viral RNA from antiviral sensing, is it compartmentalization, is it something that happens on the surface. Uh, and with the model, we could evaluate the importance of each one of these separately and in a formal way. So as a starting point, let's talk about our complete model. Uh, what I'm showing here are, uh, is a time course of viral protein production as an early surrogate of the, the uh, time course of infection. In the base model, RNA, we, what we are assuming is that RNA is degraded just as well on VROs as in the cytoplasm. But if we eliminate, we say that uh, RNA is completely protected in VROs, um, when we do that, the infection proceeds uh, pretty much unaltered as if we uh, gave it the same degradation kinetics. In many ways, excluding that is a really important role quantitatively in, in the simulations. In addition, the base, in our base model, the double strand RNA that's created on VRO surfaces is sensed equally by the host cell. We can likewise turn the head off uh, and show that infection is again unaltered. And the last thing uh, which we have encoded in the model is the surface chemistry of the VROs. If one does uh, geometric calculations for the volume, um, the local volume on the surface of a membrane subject to transmembrane proteins and things that are doing that, the chemistry, ends up being about a 3,000-fold increase in effective concentration 
and thus forward rate of association. And um, we found that this was absolutely essential for viral progression. If you drop down that concentrating effect, even to something that's pretty dramatic, several hundred fold increase in uh, accelerated rates, not enough for the virus to take out. And so what this argues for is that at least for enteroviruses, VROs are in many ways pure surface accelerants. These uh, reactions need to occur on surfaces that have them happen fast enough to explain the speed of enteroviral infections that usually finish in about eight hours or so. Uh, one other thing that in this sort of model development that we needed to come to terms with was that some of those parameters, I said we had 90% from the literature, uh, but some were, uh, were and forever would be unknowable. Uh, and those mostly revolved around these interferon stimulated genes in the middle here in purple. So let's pull the veil off one of these edges in the cartoon. As I mentioned, Quickly, we have a dynamical system, has loads of feedback. And this is really the purview of models built from differential equations. This is what our model is about. We define a maximum conceivable rate of interferon stimulated gene synthesis. And then that edge is elaborated with um, two terms. The first abstracts a nine step biochemical mechanism from double strand RNA to the uh, induction of interferon stimulated genes into a sigmoidal input output equation with two free parameters. Note that the double strand RNA concentration we can take directly from the model. The second term describes the antagonism by the viral proteinases whose concentration we by extension take directly from the model but whose potency as indicated by this half maximal effective concentration we will never fully know in vivo. And this is a lumped term. We're talking about all of the substrates in the cell, many edges here that are getting disrupted. Um, but even in the midst of that lumping and uncertainty, we have some qualitative constraints based upon experiments. Start with the base, uh, let's start with the stripped down model where there is no double strand RNA sensing and no antagonism. Here, what I'm showing are uh, the virions now, it's a longer time course, and the number at the end is a rough estimate of the PFUs according to those ratios that I described earlier. So if you strip everything away, the infection takes off and proceeds unabated. However, if they're sensing alone, double strand RNA, the mobilization of an interferon response, the endogenously triggered interferon stimulated genes with all of those flat arrowheads emanating from them in the cartoon are sufficient to stop the infection. However, when antagonism is in place, because ordinarily this pathway is damaged by viral proteinases, the infection proceeds with kinetics that are only slightly delayed when we put antagonism back in the model. So this is our, our full model. In addition, cells can receive interferons uh, from their infected neighbors or uh, nearby inflammatory cells. And we took those in the model as going straight to max synthesis. And if that's done at time t equals zero, so it per chance the cell starts the infection and also gets a coincident stimulus of interferon, the infection is completely averted. However, if that warning signal from neighboring interferons arrives too late, the negative feedback has already been engaged and it's as if the cells had never received it, viral progression proceeds. Evan, can I ask a question here? Certainly. Um, so in, in your model, uh, in the infected cell, what is the kinetics of um, ISG expression? You didn't show us that. You showed us the consequences of it, but I'm, I would have guessed uh, it's uh, occurring in the, you know, the hours time scale. But what, what is it precisely? And, and how does it correspond to the actual data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's going to be, it's, sorry, it's informed by here, what, we, what we're having is, is where my pointer go. We have an input output relationship here right. that's proportional. This rate of synthesis is maxed out, assuming that all of the RNA polymerases are docked on the locus. Mm -hmm. And we take a representative ISG length to say that if you have a polymerase transcribing a typical length ISG all the time, how much can you churn out at any given, given time? 
And then that's dialed up or dialed down based upon how much double strand RNA there is in the, uh, in the system. When, right, we run but, the, when we run the simulations, this triggers, it, it then boils down to when do you get enough double strand RNA in the system, the model, to engage the response. And that uh, kicks in, in, I would say, we start seeing it being detectable probably about at four hours into infection. So right around when those membranes start to happen, right when the double, double strand RNA really starts picking up in, during, during the infection. The way that we have it simulated is that's when you start seeing the onset of, of interferon gene synthesis. Right. I guess what I, I was trying to, to um, think about the kinetics of uh, you know viral replication, and then of course overlaid on it this this uh, this the induction of these interferon genes, and obviously there has to be some gap between the two, and it yep. wasn't clear to me what that is in the actual model. Oh yeah, and, and I that they, they are. In the model there, there, we have no encoded time delay to like I slow see. it down or delay. We just say, if it comes in, then the process starts. The only delay that arrives from it is just how long it takes to transcribe a gene and mm -hmm. give rise to the accumulation. And we know yeah. in other experiments, which I won't show today, if you transfect in double strand CVB3, or just in vitro transcribed RNA, you'll get massive interferon stimulated genes in a few hours of delivering it to the cells. And so we're in the right, the idea that these get rapidly mobilized is consistent right. with the experiment. Thanks. Yep. Okay. And so collectively these five qualitative constraints ended up being very strong, uh, criteria for what some of those phenomenological parameters had to be to conform to these types of types of rules. Okay, uh, the title of my last slide, but, well, I talked about how the model was wrong in some respects. The title said useful, but I didn't really talk about whether this was useful or not. And so what we sought to do was apply the model in a way that would empower the computational biology and see if we could find something new that we could circle back to experiments and, and, and do. And the way that we did that was tackling those phenomenological parameters, those pur purple arrows head on, iterating through hundreds of different parameter combinations with or without neighboring interferon stimulation, like I just described, added at different time points post-infection. And in doing so, we found something interesting and non-obvious when we changed the susceptibility of that double strand uh, RNA pathway, sensing pathway, to damage by the viral proteases. To remind, this was that EC50 value and the negative feedback that I just described one slide ago. And we altered the model to render the cells mildly more resistant. We saw the expected mild decrease in virions released. So they're more able to mount an interferon response, and somewhat so, and that gives a somewhat more delayed time course of the infection. However, we did the same conditions and we ran simulations with interferon signaling from neighbors, the behavior changed. Comparing those purple and green traces, they were brought together if there was coincident interferon stimulation, but then further apart at later times. So it actually, there was an exaggerated discrepancy between the small, the small change in the extent of resistance when paracrine interferons were added at these later times. In fact, at those later times, six hours, the separation was detectably greater between the green and the purple than if there was no neighboring interferon signaling around, compare over here on the left-hand side. If this prediction held true in cells, it would suggest that relatively small changes in the biochemical property of antiviral signaling pathways could be amplified in target tissues in vivo where infection is always proceeding asynchronously, one host cell at a time. So what we would envision, you're always having this timed uh, competition of the inflammatory environment and then when cells happen to get infection, uh, an infection. So for an experimental test, we needed to dive into this nine member pathway that I mentioned briefly and identify precisely where the viral proteinases might be targeting and how. And using clues from the literature, uh, we converged upon the mitochondrial antiviral signaling protein or called MAVs, which is reported to target uh, to be targeted by the 3C uh, proteinase. And uh, which is what we found uh, as evidence here by this cleavage of a 35 kilovolt product of MAV specifically in uh, CBB3 infected cells. 
but we need it to better than just that the target is cleaved um, because the, uh, the only way we could make the pathway resistant was to know the exact site on MAVS that was cleaved. And here we turn to mining through bioinformatics. MAVS is a protein is a very interesting antiviral uh, factor. Harmit uh, Malik's group at the Hut showed that this gene is rapidly evolving in primates and its sequence may reflect past exposure to ancient viruses. If one looks at the MAVS sequence in primates, there is a splice site variant that adds six amino acids to the protein sequence of hominoids and old world monkeys at the top here, which is absent from new world monkeys shown here on the, the bottom. In that sequence is a strong match for the peptide motif that enteroviral 3C proteinases like to cut. And uh, here, just as an aside, I'd like to thank Cheryl Borgman in my lab who helped rebuild this 3C protonase sequence logo during the quarantine, <laughs> essentially by replicating this 25-year-old paper from scratch. Now, importantly, chimpanzees and even uh, African green monkeys uh, here show evidence of Coxsackie viral infections in the literature. But new world monkeys, such as the marmoset, are confirmed negative even when maintained in captivity. And this is at the point where I, I, I uh, remind students that interlibrary borrowing services work just fine during the quarantine. So it's good to go back to the old literature, even if it's not in your language. All right, so we had our candidate site. And so for here, the experimental path to testing the model prediction was pretty clear. We engineered cells to contain an inducible, doxycycline inducible, epitope flag, epitope tagged MAVs with or without that position 271, mutated from glutamine to an alanine which would destroy the recognition site, the cleavage site for 3C pro. I made the inducible expression pretty strong to dilute out the impact of endogenous MAVs. Uh, and we confirmed that CBB3 induced cleavage is significantly reduced in the alanine mutant compared to the glutamine, which was also ectopically expressed. Although the overall effect is incomplete because we still have residual cleavage of endogenous MAVs. This difference in cleavage coincided with a difference in viral plaques and infectious virions released after infection with CBB3. So here are those um, uh, plaque forming units that I touched on before. And now for the test. We took these cells and infected them with CBB3, then stimulated them with recombinant interferon at different times post-infection. At early times, four and five hours, like I showed in the simulations, the difference between the two conditions here, these two uh, cell lines disappeared. But then at later time points, the separation increased and was somewhat more dramatic than if interferon had never been added. So it was qualitatively consistent with this kind of compression and then expansion that was seen up and predicted by the model. So therefore the wrong parts of our model was still used for at uncovering uh, this experimentally verified result. These findings got us more interested in MAVS regulation and the uh, history by the various synonyms that it goes by. And those are all listed on the title here. Uh, the, I like this figure on the left because it's structurally accurate, but it's somewhat complicated. And so I'm going to break down the acronym soup here down into sensors, transducers, uh, and effectors. How does the MAVS pathway give rise to mobilization of an interferon response? Well, there are these sensors. Um, the one that's relevant for uh, CBB3 is called MBA5. This cartoon is for the other one called the Rig Eye. And what these sensor proteins do, they have a domain called a caps cast space activation and recruitment domain or card domain that likes to self-assemble at high local concentrations. And uh, that occurs when there's recognition by the, the, the sensor proteins along double-stranded RNA. MADS, one term, uh, is a mitochondrial transmembrane protein that also has one of these card domains and that once nucleated by the sensor bound to double strand RNA rapidly forms long polymerized filaments on the mitochondrial surface. And these filaments recruit additional signaling uh, proteins that culminate in the interferon response and the induction of ISG. MAVS has all these alternate names because its discovery was published by four different groups within one month of each other. Uh, all, and although the findings are similar, the means by which they obtained the MAVS construct were different. Uh, and, and I think it's because since James Chen group uh, was the first by a week, the official 
gene name became Mavs and everyone, including us, uses the same commercially available cDNA image clone uh, as, as he did. But that clone does not have the reference protein sequence for Mav. Uh, and I'll credit Lishan Wan and my group for originally pointing out this difference when we were depositing the plasmid in our uh, local database. Specifically, there is a glutamate in position 93 here uh, when the reference has a glutamine. To orient you, this schematic uh, has our flag epitope tagged maps construct with the self assembly domain, the signaling domains, the transmembrane domain for the mitochondria highlighted along with the earlier cleavage site, the 271 that I described, which separates assembly from localization. And so this uh, 93 site here early, early on, we ignored because the change um, thousand, in thousands genomes said that this was a common polymorphic variant in the human population. The glutamate allele was rarer overall, rather rare of those in uh, African descent but it was just as prevalent as glutamine in the East Asian population. Yet the glutamine is widely conserved in mammals and its presence creates a potential second cleavage site for 3C, which would also separate localization, excuse me, localization from signaling just as the 271 site would. So let's test it. We substituted glutamine for glutamate and confirmed that during um, uh, CBB3 infection, it is indeed cleaved at the expected position. This one yields a shorter 18 kilodalton uh, product uh, and uh, as quantified here. And then the next step was to test whether it had any impact on overall infectivity. And before showing the result, I should explain what our expectation uh, was uh, but before we, I showed the, the, the result. So we have this glutamine substitution, which now gives two cleavage sites on MABs. And what we thought was that by being twice as likely to be cleaved by 3C, the glutamine allele would be less potent as an antiviral signaling molecule compared to the original MABs that we had been working with. Wrong. And not only wrong, we were interestingly wrong because the glutamine allele was even more potent than the MAVs that we started with. And it also added, added complexity. It also reduced the cleavage at the other 271 site that I described earlier. There's some sort of coupling here. Um, and it was at this point that we recognized that we were in over our heads and we needed a new abstraction that focused on the behavior of MAVs specifically. So this is a separate model. Uh, and one that un unlike the complete kinetic model from before uh, focuses on connections and feedback and is less concerned with the specific parameter values. So for here, fast is 100, average is one and slow is 0.1, but we have no units or anything from that. All right, so we built a, this state model in which uh, MAVS is synthesized or activated, it doesn't matter for this abstract model. Uh, and assumed to self-assemble rapidly on the mitochondrial surface, like I shown in the previous cartoon. And these filament size is large. The estimates are about 800 of these MAVS molecules get together. And uh, because it's on a surface, we assumed in this model that the assembly is, is instantaneous uh, because it had uh, restricted diffusion on the, on the mitochondrial surface. When these polymerized filaments form, uh, they can be disposed of. They're disposed of by an autophagic uh, route but they also give rise to signaling and the production of interferon stimulated genes. When there is no cleavage, MAVs and polymavs reach steady state values that one could solve for just like you would in a differential equations class. However, when we incorporate the steady state production of 3C proteinase and one cleavage event corresponding to our original MAVs, there is an additional route to MAVs elimination and the production of interferon stimulated genes now is no longer sustained. I'll say for bio, uh, we, we included this negative feedback here on MAVS accumulation for uh, biological completeness. There was evidence in the literature, but it turned out not to be critical for any of the properties that I'll describe here. Interestingly, when um, the, uh, when the, the two, the, we had two now separate routes to MAVS degradation as with the glutamine polymorphism, that last one that we talked about, we see a different behavior now with sustained ISG production. 
Why? Well, the flat brown polymaps trace on the right here is not a steady state, but it's a slowly decaying exponential when the amount of monomeric maps gets small relative to filamentous maps, you can, which can then be approximated in this. Remember that N here, the, the size of the maps filament is 800. So it's decaying, but with a very, very um, long time constant. What occurs is that the polymorphism reaches this decay four times as fast because with two routes to degradation, this alpha value here is having uh, two rather than uh, than one um, causes filamentous maps to reach its peak twice as fast and then trough twice as fast from there and then stay longer in that slowly decaying regime. So what this suggested is that the current understanding of MAB in this very rudimentary model is sufficient to explain the counterintuitive behavior of these variants that we showed experiment. Okay. Human variation in MAVs may have importance for infectious disease. Recall that that single cleavage MAVs variant has a prevalence of 50% in the East Asian population. And what that means is that roughly 25% of East Asians are homozygous for the more virally susceptible single cleavage variant. East Asia also struggles with endemic enteroviral disease, which outbreaks every three years or so. And the peak incidence occurs among children two or three years of age um, and, and thus it's tempting to speculate that the cycles of outbreaks might relate to building up enough virus naive homozygous individuals in the population to foster community spread and last there, there have been multiple uh, efforts to develop clinical inhibitors of enteroviral 3c proteinases and uh, in fact a phase two uh, compound or made, you know, compounds made it all the way to phase two, but were eventually stopped because of lack of e efficacy. Although interestingly, this was before uh, MABs had even been named. And I actually don't, uh, the original intent of these three C inhibitors was to block the maturation of the enterovirus uh, itself. Uh, but I see that being very effective because it's an intramolecular step that for us in the model, we assume it to be instantaneous. Uh, however, it's a very different question um, is whether or not it could be effective at inhibiting host cell damage, the collateral damage of those 3C proteinases on other targets, such as MABs. Um, and uh, this is something to think about in ways in which we might be able to uh, enable cells to unleash their own antiviral mechanisms against these microbes. Uh, where are we going from here? Um, well, for us, we want to go deeper into CVB3, but also broader into other enteroviruses. And I'll share this Ames figure, let's exiting a vigorous round of grant writing, um, which summarizes how we plan to elaborate several of these modules toward more widespread, but also more, more individualized variation. And I'll touch briefly on one here, uh, the viral delivery, where over the summer, um, I talked about this modular organization of the, uh, of the model. We swapped out the CDB3 delivery module for that of poliovirus. Poliovirus has one receptor instead of two, like CDB3, and its internalization kinetics do not involve an endosomal intermediate, um, therefore a much faster poliovirus gets into the cell. And these differences are sufficient to make qualitative predictions about the response to delayed interference. Harinder, you're asking about but the kinetics and speed here, if we spike in uh, interferon an hour and a half in, that's very early as far as the CVB3 infection uh, is concerned, but it is not fast enough for poliovirus but because by, at that point it's already gone and it's off to, off to the races from there. And this is something that we could test uh, in, in the lab um, where we're actually gonna proposing to dedicate research effort is to adopt a similar strategy uh, to encode another family of enteroviruses, the rhinoviruses, common cold. These have long been known to exhibit um, a temperature dependence, wherein they propagate about five-fold better at 33 degrees Celsius compared to 37 degrees Celsius. Why? Well, one could say that you know, airway temperatures and nasal passages and things is more at 33, 34 degrees Celsius, and so there's um, you know, an evolutionary advantage to propagating better at that temperature. And that sounds okay, 
but, but I'm still left with why. Everything should be slower at 33, 34 degrees Celsius than 37. It's not clear how you can get a more efficient infection at that lower temperature. And so what we're seeking to do is build delivery modules for the major and minor groups of rhinoviruses. And then we're proposing to propagate temperature as a systems level perturbation throughout the model using these relationships that everyone was tortured with in organic, uh, in organic chemistry back in college. So known chemical, kinetic, and thermodynamic relationships that describe how rate parameters and equilibrium constants are changed as a function of the temperature that operates. And our hypothesis is that the thermodynamics of rhinoviral encapsidation um, is going to overwhelm any acceleration of the upstream processes from delivery on down that might be sped up in an Arrhenius type of uh, way by uh, uh, going from the permissive temperature to that elevated temperature. So the essence of what, what, what we believe is that running rhinovirus at a hotter temperature gets it set up in a kinetic trapping situation where too many things happen too early and there's not enough downstream process to be able to accommodate that. And then you run out of certain components and then the whole system does not work as effectively. And we think that's, uh, we think there's support for this because of this enthalpy term here, which is substantially different if one compares poliovirus or let's say more conventional enterovirus to something like rhinovirus. So these are ideas, speculation proposals that are hopefully to be continued in the future. Another thing that we're interested in doing a better job with um, in the model are those viral replication organelles or VROs that I, I dwelled on in the beginning. Uh, to remind, these organelles are crucial for viral progression. And we showed earlier that the, the, the model gave strong arguments for a membrane concentrating or accelerating effect. What I didn't tell you is that the creation of the VROs computationally is, is um, is, is very abrupt, artificially abrupt uh, in the model where the, we go for a certain period of time. And then when we reach a critical concentration of the 3D polymerase, there's a jump into the VRO regime and then everything proceeds in that um, accelerated way. What's um, surprising is that this sharp transition is really critical for the model results. So this is the step that I'm showing here and on the right are the simulated time courses for positive and negative strand RNA over, what was it, uh, eight hours or so, I think, in this simulation. Not every transition from the minimum to that full-blown VRO is permitted in the model. For instance, if we, uh, the simulation is recoded with a linear ramp um, from no VROs to mature VROs, the predicted concentrations of positive and negative strand viral genomes all of a sudden become extremely noisy and unstable as a function of the parameter values. Uh, and this result is interesting because a 30 year old report um, uh, which reconstituted poliovirus replication in a test tube. So this is an in vitro viral replication assay here where the membranes are present but it's in cell fragments are present in a dilute and passive type of concentration. The, these authors also noted a 100-fold variation in viral RNA yield from batch to batch that they were unable to explain. And we think it may be a result of disrupting the, the transition to this VRO type regime. And what's really curious is that, uh, that not every steep transition is created equal. So for example, um, here we substituted a Hill function with a cooperativity of 10. So it was a pretty cooperative process. And it does even worse than the ramp with regard to the robustness of uh, infection. To phenocopy the step, we needed to invoke cooperativity is on the order of 40, which is larger than any known biological process. And this is way beyond hemoglobin. Now, by contrast, a higher order, what are we gonna call this a slope? Uh, does quite well. And here where the, the, the transition approaches the max value according to the concentration of the 3D polymerase, but raised to an nth power. And the pretty modest powers of the polymerase, five or six, I think is what's shown here, are sufficient for robust infection. And my hypothesis is that this multiplicity, this kind of power law function is related to the multiplicity of RNA templates bound to multiple ri uh, ribosomes, so-called polysomes. 
that must dock to the membrane surface. The model is currently encoded for have polysomes with two or three ribosomes bound to each viral RNA. So if you have two or three, and then two of those groups of two or three got together, then you'd have a group of five or six ribosomes in the same vicinity making polymerase and other viral protein uh, subunits. And now you're off to the races because they're both happen to come together. So this five or six may actually be a, just a bimolecular reaction coming together comprised of multiple protein-protein uh, associations. And we're dwelling on this because I think it's, it's one of those rare instances where the model could give insight into nucleating processes that are not directly observable in cells. This is before you have the VRO even detectable by electron microscopy. And so it, it, it raises the opportunity for computation to give access to something that would be difficult or impossible to do by experiment. That's everything. I want to close by acknowledging the students who led or assisted the work that I showed you today. It's been a multi-generational effort. I had the dates there, uh, but it's one that I found truly fulfilling. And, um, and I'll just leave this up. If you're interested in learning more, we just uh, revamped my, my lab's webpage if you want to check it out. We have the requisite Zoom social activity picture on there. Uh, and then I'll also give you information about the UBA uh, biomedical engineering program, uh, which is uh, not as well endowed as you guys are, but we have 12 faculty uh, that focused on various domains of systems biology. So please, uh, students, give us a look. And uh, thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions in the time remaining. Great, wonderful talk. Uh, for starting, we can just let people unmute if anyone has any pressing questions. Um, I have a question, um, Kevin. So um, you, hi, Kevin. So you mentioned that you, uh, you know, uh, Arrhenius relation, you use that to uh, explain this temperature dependence. Since, uh, you know, this process involves a lot of enzymes, enzymatic uh, activity can be, you know, the temperature dependence can be uh, very complex, non-monotonic. That can also provide a not alternative uh, uh, explanation on the dependence. So how, mm -hmm. do you, you know, how do you think about this? Yes, ab absolutely. And, and that I ran through um, pretty quickly. The, um, what we think is, we, we think that the, therm the thermodynamic arguments that I get are going to, to uh, overwhelm the, the enzyme dependent kinetic changes, but we can also keep track of those in the model. And so there are actually a remarkable uh, amount of literature on activation energy barriers for several of these and the enzymes that, that are that are cat catalyzed. Um, it was it was surprising when we looked in the literature to, to find how many were out there. And so the plan is to keep track of also those temperature dependent enzyme changes as a function of temperature. And then when we, we do these temperature shifts, we'll be keeping track of each one of those going on. Hmm. We'll have to see if um, if a shift from Third, I mean, it's a pretty modest shift that we're, we're looking at here from 33 to 37. We'll hope we, we don't run into a non-monotonic regime of where those mm -hmm. simple, you know, okay. Arrhenius type of relationships break down. Uh, but we, we, we'll be looking at that very carefully. So I think it'll, it, it, um, we don't know the answer. It's a bit of a, you know, a risky idea, but I think it will be something that really pushes the model to see how it, how it does in the face of a, a complex perturbation that will then propagate through many of the the, the phases of the viral life cycle. Kevin, um, one of the things you pointed out in the introduction with all of these viruses is, is, the, <clears throat> is the fact that um, you know, there can be big differences between the number of particles um, that are shed or released by an infected cells and the, the actual number of infective um, you know, particles. And, and this is due to variation in the assembly process itself and a lot of heterogeneity in the, in, the, in the viral particles that are generated. And I wondered, can this modeling um, framework that you are developing, right, can it also be applied to, to look at um, the heterogeneity of, of viral particles? Because that biologically becomes hugely interesting uh, and important. Yes. I have. Um... In, in this, the, the spirit of my grant writing mode that I just emerged from, I, I do have a high, one of these high risk, high reward ones pending where we try to think about th these types of complete kinetic models applied more broadly beyond the enterovirus family. 
So the, the enteroviruses were a good starting point because a lot of the heterogeneity that you mentioned about like the, the differences in the viral packaging, the, since these are so small, coronaviruses and things, mostly the variation and the, 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 where the particle, the PFU is thought to come from is mutations on, on um, errors in the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and they just don't go forward after they make the virus. But that is not true for other fi viral families and those are special challenges but as we, um, as I'm teaching myself these other viruses, there there are some good opportunities. Um, that, that I, I think um, what we try to do is take measured rather than just like um, bold but ignorant leaps. Try to take measured steps out from from there. So I think we're going to look start looking at other positive strand RNA viruses that may have some common themes with uh, enteroviruses. And then we'll kind of see how we do and move out forward from, from, from there. Um, I um, do have a, um, a, new, a relatively new postdoc who joined me who did his whole thesis on, um, on respiratory syncytial virus. So these pneumoviridae and other sorts of, they, they're really complicated, negative strand, a lot of that heterogeneity like you're talking about. That one's about as far as we'd risk to go up to this point, but there's possibilities for this. I mean, they're choosing processes. You can encode these things. It's, it's, there's likely some you know, probabilistic arguments for packaging about the chances of things getting together. And those are things that can be formalized and simulated. Right. I was wondering if you could speculate, um, you know, you talk about the different polymorphisms, um, kind of uncoupling different aspects of MAVs regulation and function. Um, it's Kind of be beyond viral susceptibility, can you speculate about you know MAVs dependent signaling and gene expression and like if you have any? I mean, I know you didn't really uh, test it. I'm just curious if you've if you're since you kind of mentioned in your aims that you're planning to look more at patients and polymorphisms. Have you thought about um, that uncoupling and what you might see in terms of gene expression? Yeah, and and um, in this presentation, I I talked about all the MAVs stuff in in many ways separate from the the model. So we have like a lot of complicated stuff with MABs and then we have the complicated the virus, but the interferon induction there was quite, was quite simple. Um, we, we adopted a similar approach, like what I described for, for MABs with the, with the polymorphism and did this more systematically, looked in dbSNP for variants that would create or destroy C3 proteinase cleavage sites and then cross-reference them against innate immune genes. And there are other examples of polymorphisms that create them. The one that sticks out either ERF3 or ERF7 has a site that is 10%, I think in the African, uh, 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 individuals of African descent that creates a uh, C3 proteinase cleavage site, at least bioinformatically predicted in there. And we have a couple of other examples all along the interferon pathway. So I think what, what's in the proposal is to look at this now formally. We, I, I don't think we're gonna be able to just, if we wanna do this all together, I think we're gonna need a dedicated model of double strand RNA all the way to interfere on gene synthesis and start addressing those exact uh, questions. We haven't done it yet, but I think we're, we're needing to go in that direction because you're gonna have a baseline susceptibility to filament formation um, or um, other types of things that would need to be encoded. And they need to see how those end up propagating on, on further, further down. So all in, hopefully in the works, we'll see. Hi, Kevin, uh, this is Jishnu, a really Hi. great talk. Uh, and like you clearly show the impact of polymorphisms uh, on the host side, but have you considered looking at polymorphisms that could potentially co-evolve with host mutations on the viral side and the host pathogen interface and how would that fit into the whole thing? Yeah, uh, excellent question. This is another one. It, it, it's, there, there are elements that are similar with what uh, Arinder was asking. That's where I think I originally thought it was going because one place where you do have diversity in enteroviruses is in mutations or other sorts of alterations in the genome that occur by virtue, they always occur because of the error uh, uh, propensity of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. One of the things that we exploited with enteroviruses and picornaviruses more generally is because their genome is very small and very compact, there's not anywhere near as much of the flexibility to, uh, to do those types of evolutionary things that you were describing. But it certainly, it, 
would need to co uh, would need to be taken into consideration when one looks more broadly, or one even looks within um, even for the same virus and selecting for growth in different settings. I, I touched on this very briefly. This is a is transmitted or as an oral fecal transmitted virus, so you're infecting um, target tissues, but the place that's really dangerous for CBB3 is in the heart. We, all our host cells are cardiomyocyte derived cells, but you can also set up shop in, in other host cell settings. And in that context, very minor variants, which probably relate to um, uh, slight changes in either the viral docking or maybe some of these enzymatic changes and things could have evolutionary advantages for the host cell context, either maybe to form the membranes, maybe do all those other things. And um, we are interested in that. That's not in the, the proposal, but we are doing some things to try to lay the groundwork to um, very much akin to um, the cancer model from the beginning. If, if we can go from omics public data to very rapidly to copy numbers of some of these initial conditions in the, in the model of the host cell setting, we may be able to then um, think about doing that where we're running now multiple host cell contexts with the same virus and then see what the outcomes are uh, from, from there. So I think that's a terrific, uh, terrific idea. That's probably the direction I would go uh, right now. Thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Okay, if not, um, we can all thank our speaker for a wonderful talk. Um, and uh, I believe you should have gotten another link that will be for all of your, your meetings today. I do, I see it there. I'll track it down on my computer and then I think I'm next up with Arindar in the other yeah. Zoom room. So I'll see yeah. you in a bit. Great, see you on the other <laughs> so All right, terrific, thanks.